Thank you so much. I thought uh, I would tell you a story tonight uh, about my wife and my children. Uh, I thought he was gay. No. <laughs> Married to a lady with a penis. I have two children right now, eight and 11, and you know, they're fine. Uh, well, they are, they're fine, you know, but I, yeah, I love them, but I have a lot of, I have some lingering resentment towards them, particularly uh, the older, uh, my son, whose name I cannot remember, but. <laughs> And it's because when we had him, I was not ready to be a parent. Uh, I don't know that anybody is ever fully ready. I was not ready. And this was a couple of years after I got married and my wife said, you know what? I, I think we should have kids now. And I said, I also think we should have kids, not now. <laughs> And I wanted kids, you know, but I wanted them in a kind of abstract way. <laughs> like the way I might want a jukebox, for example. <laughs> you know, like you're ever reading like Sky Mall or something and there's like this amazing jukebox and you're like, oh, it's a classic jukebox from the 50s. That's an amazing jukebox. I want to get that jukebox someday. <laughs> That's how I was with kids. And she was like, but I'm getting old and I don't want to be an old mom. And I'm like, but I'm the same age as you and I'm not getting old. <laughs> but I understood what she meant because reproductively speaking, ladies, you peak early. You are the Frankie Muniz of genders. <laughs> So you just need to get it done. And because I love her, I agreed to put a baby in her. <laughs> Not literally, because I wouldn't do that <laughs> to her or the baby. I mean, I don't have a baby, but if I did, like I wouldn't put it in her. Not without the proper tools, you guys. <laughs> and I didn't have the tools, and I didn't have the baby. Plus, even if I had a baby, like, it would defeat the purpose to put it in her. Because honestly, we'd just be trying to get it right back out. So I agreed to attempt to impregnate her, and that's what we did. We, we started, uh, you know, baby making, and it wasn't going well. Uh, you know, one month goes by, two months, three months, nothing's happening, four months goes by, five months goes by, and we're not making babies. And, you know, I'm starting to get worried and I'm starting to think, oh my God, maybe there's something wrong with one of us, her. And I'm starting to think, <laughs> I'm starting to think, you know, maybe we're just not destined to have children. You know, maybe we'll be one of these, you know, sad, childless couples, you know, who kind of go through like, you know, sleeping late and traveling the world. And, you know, that would be terrible. But then, on the sixth month, I'm in my bedroom and she comes out of the bathroom and she's holding up her magic pee stick and she goes, guess what? I'm pregnant. And I go, wow. You know, because what do you say? You know, I don't, wow. I go, and you know, I go up to her and I give her a big hug and a big kiss. And she goes, are you happy? And I go, yes, I am. Are you happy? And she goes, yes, I am. And I don't believe either of us. <laughs> because that is terrifying when that happens. When, you know, you're gonna be a parent and like you were trying, you know, and it's like, oh, I regret this immediately. <laughs> well, cause I, I, my biggest fear was that I was gonna be a bad dad, you know? I mean, how many books have been written about bad dads and movies written about bad dads and Everclear songs written about bad dads? <laughs> You know, and 
I don't want to be the kind of father that inspires art, you know? <laughs> So I have all this fear in me, all this anxiety, and it's manifesting itself as me just being a total jerk to my wife. I, I'm, I, and I, I wish I could say it was otherwise, it was not, I was being horrible to her. An example, she has morning sickness, like almost immediately. She feels bad, she's throwing up every morning, you know. And so I'm doing things like, you know, opening a can of tuna and eating it in front of her, like first thing in the morning, you know, I'm just like, hmm, this tuna's delicious. And she'd be like, could you not eat the tuna in front of me at dawn, you know? And I'm like, oh, are you gonna take eating tuna out of a can away from me, just like you've taken everything else? <laughs> Things like that, you know? The worst thing I ever did was, you know, as, as the baby was getting close to being born, she's like, you know, we really need to paint the baby's nursery. And I'm like, you're absolutely right. Here's a step ladder. And I walked away. <laughs> That's the kind of sh I'm doing. So one day, right before the baby's due, I'm thinking to myself, I gotta get better, I gotta get my act together. Let me do something for the baby. What does the baby need? Ah, the baby needs a new desk. <laughs> for me to put my laptop on, so I can play online poker. So I'm gonna get the baby a desk. So I get into my car, it's a 1999 Volkswagen New Beetle, and I'm puttering to the desk store to buy the desk, and I turn on the radio, and a song comes on that I'd never heard before by a band I instantly recognize from their one previous hit. It's uh, a terrible band by the name of Creed. <laughs> And I am not a musical snob by any means. My favorite song is Come On Eileen by Dexy's Midnight Runners. My second favorite song is Mbop. So I'm not out there waving the flag of musical superiority, but Creed really is terrible. But there's this song, you probably heard it, it's called With Arms Wide Open. And it's about a fellow who finds himself in a similar situation as me, <laughs> discovers he's going to be a father, and reacts with love and acceptance as opposed to hatred and rejection. <laughs> I'll sing a little bit of it for you. It goes like this. Well, I just heard <laughs> the news today. Seems my life is gonna change. And in my head right now, you guys, I'm shirtless. <laughs> and I'm not allowed to sing any more of the song because you have to pay a lot of money for that. <laughs> but I'll, sing, I'll sort of do the essence of the chorus for you. You know, it goes, Mama, standing in awe, you know, and there's life happening. And he says, and, you know, and he says, I'm going to be a better man, you know, and that's my fondest wish for you. And I don't know what kind of man lead singer Scott Stapp is, <laughs> but I hope his son is a better singer. <laughs> so my reaction to hearing this corny ass, horrible song, is violent, <laughs> uncontrollable, sustained, weeping. <laughs> uh, I am just undone. I am blubbering in my Volkswagen New Beetle so hard I have to pull the car over. And it's already the most effeminate car in the world. <laughs> You've seen it, it's just two smooth lumps. It's like I'm driving around in Justin Bieber's nutsack. That's what it looks like. So, and it's like the lead, it's like Scott Tab is just kicking me in my nutsack as he's saying, you know, ow, ow, you know. Every fluid imaginable is coming out of me, you know, snot and water, semen is coming out. 
But that's because I associate sex with crying, so it's actually not that unexpected. <laughs> But I needed that, you guys. That's what I realized. I needed to go through this emotional catharsis. I needed to kind of unburden myself of all this fear and anxiety that I was holding up inside me for eight and a half months. And afterwards, I felt better. And afterwards, I definitely took a step towards fatherhood. The point is this, you guys. Creed changed my life. <laughs> When my son was born, I remember, you know, I was in there in the delivery room, and it's amazing, and, you know, I cut the umbilical cord with my teeth. It was like this great <laughs> primal thing, and I'll never forget this moment I had with my son uh, about four months after he was born. It's an incredible moment. We're, we're up. We're in the, it's the middle of the night, you know, and, and I'm up with him, you know, and he's crying, and I'm holding him, and we're the only ones up, you know. In, in the world, and I'm... <laughs> haven't slept in, you know, since he's been born in four months, and I, I remember looking at him, and he's looking at me, and, you know, his face is all scrunched up and purple and mewling, you know, and, you know. and I remember I, I looked at him, and I had this thought. I, I, I was thinking, you know what? I'd really like to shake this baby. <laughs> to Lamar's class, and at Lamar's class, they're very specifically telling you, don't shake the baby. They say it repeatedly throughout the 10-week course, don't shake your baby. You have to watch a movie about it. The movie is called Don't Shake Your Baby. And there's a lady in the movie who's like, I shook my baby. And it was really bad. Its head fell off, so <laughs> don't shake your baby. So, you know, after like 10 weeks of this, you're like, I get it. Like, I'm not gonna shake my baby. <laughs> I think I'm gonna shake this baby. <laughs> I know what they said in class, but I really feel like the baby needs a good shaking, you know? <laughs> not enough to like permanently hurt it, you know what I mean? Just like a quick, oh. <laughs> just to kind of startle him into silence, you know? Just a And he would go, oh, uh, I guess I was acting like a real life just then. And I would say, I forgive you. You guys, I did not shake my baby. Thank you. I threw my baby. <laughs> There's a sofa here. I'm here. The baby's crying. I'm like, I'm gonna shake this baby. And I'm like, no, you can't shake the baby. I'm like, really think I'm gonna shake the baby. No, you can't shake the baby. Well, I don't know what to do. I'm gonna shake this baby. No, you can't shake the baby. <laughs> and then there's definitely a moment where I'm thinking to myself, did I just throw that baby? <laughs> There's a baby over there. And I don't see how that baby gets over there. Unless I threw it. Thank God the baby was fine. But listen to me, you guys. For serious, you guys. Never, ever, ever shake your baby. And never, ever, ever throw your baby. But I will say this. After I threw that baby, that baby shut the hell up. <laughs> Thank you guys very 